I have always been a politics junkie. I love reading and hearing about politics. I love it. I think when I was much younger, I used to think that if you knew enough about it, you could change people's minds. You could have discussions and reason stuff out. And as I've gotten older and the country's gotten more partisan, now I see that so much political media is not aimed at changing anybody's opinion. It's aimed at entrenching people in beliefs they already have. But I just find it so fascinating, the mechanics of, of persuasion, even if you're just convincing somebody they're already right. This is Plate Mark. My name is Ann Schaefer, and I'm your host. I'm an independent curator specializing in prints and printmaking, and you have reached us on series three of Plate Mark, in which we're interviewing uh, the colorful characters that make up the print ecosystem. Today's guest is somebody I think you'll like. Her name is Maureen Warren, and she is the curator at the Cranert Art Museum at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And she is a specialist in Dutch Republic political prints. She reveals to me uh, an artist who she believes rivals Rembrandt in importance, so stay tuned to find out who that is. The exhibition that she has up right now at the Cranert is called Fake News and Lying Pictures, Political Prints in the Dutch Republic, and the show is open until December 17th, 2022. So hopefully I'm getting this out in time for you all to scoot on over to Urbana Champagne and take it in. She's also produced a rather scholarly tome about the subject, although it's not directly an exhibition catalog. It is for people who really want to dig deep. It's called Paper Knives, Paper Crowns, Political Prints in the Dutch Republic. So check out that book wherever you get your books. Okay, so I've got three points of housekeeping. One, my positionality. I identify as a cis het white woman and I use the pronouns she, her. I record plate mark in Baltimore, Maryland, the land of the Piscataway Conway people. Two, any images that Maureen and I talk about are available to you on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. There's also a link there to a YouTube version of the same. You can see there's actually a video of us. You can see Maureen talking and the images that she talks about will come in over top of us. So check that out on YouTube. And the third thing is I'm always looking for support for Platemark. It's a labor of love. There is a support and donate button on the platemarkpodcast.com page. There's two options. One to become a monthly supporter at $5 a month and another one to donate a specific one-time amount. You can change the amount that's listed there to anything you wish. Okay, buckle up and let's get rolling. Maureen, it's great to see you. I'm so glad you could join us to talk about your show that just opened at the Craner Art Museum. Tell us who you are, introduce yourself, and then let's talk about the show. Sure. So I am Maureen Warren. I'm curator of European and American art at Cranard Art Museum, which is at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And the show that just opened is my baby. It's a project I've been working on for more than 10 years. So a research area, I should say, it's, it's called Fake News and Lying Pictures, Political Prints in the Dutch Republic. So... I noticed on the website that it says fake news and lying pictures in one spot, and then the spine of the book says paper knives and paper crowns. So tell it what, what up? <laughs> yeah, so that's good eye. That's right. I, that's because <laughs> the aims of the exhibition and the book are quite different, even though the subject matter is the same. So the subject matter in both is political prints, which includes things that we now call news prints, which are just scenes of events contemporaneous to the prints themselves, like proto, a kind of proto-journalism, and then also satires and allegories. But the exhibition is really geared toward the broadest possible audience, people who, you know, early modern or even Dutch Republic or Dutch rather than the Netherlands, like they don't necessarily mean anything or have special connotations. And it's, the exhibition is aiming to show how many methods have stayed the same, precursors to things like political cartoons in the newspaper and memes on the internet. So it's more about methods, artistic methods and conveying political content. The book is, the book is aimed for experts, for early modern print scholars, for Dutch art scholars, for people that study political media more broadly. The title fake news is great for the exhibit and conveying this type of, you know, 
continued evolution and carryover of these of these strategies, but the book is is more serious scholarship. <laughs> yes, there are two audiences, aren't there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get too far, the show is up in Champagne, Urbana Champagne, I always say that wrong, Urbana Champagne. Yeah. It opened on August 25th and it closes December 17th, 2022. The whole point, of course, is to talk to you about the show and encourage people to make the trip because it sounds and it looks cool from your Instagram feed. It looks really cool. There's so many terrific, really, really special things. And I think people will be surprised at the scale because for people who love Renaissance and Baroque printmaking, because especially in Talio Shrimp, prints, your copper's expensive, so they're fairly small. You know, some of these, there's a Holtzius funeral procession that's 14 feet long, you know, and there are others that are almost a meter square. So some of these are really big and hand colored, and I think that's going to be a real surprise to folks who come and see how, how pretty and impressive and funny many of these are. And the, the prints themselves swirl around a specific moment in the formation of the Dutch Republic, right? Do you want to sort of summarize that for us? They do. So I wrote my dissertation on images of a specific Dutch politician who was executed. It's basically like, for those who know early American history, if we had executed Thomas Jefferson, that level of political figure, and it splits the country into two warring parties. So two groups that define each other in opposition, can't listen to each other, can't stand one another. And Nothing. this is 1620s? Or so this execution happens in 1619, so the very early part of the century. But printmaking of this kind really starts in the Netherlands in the 1570s and 80s as they are launching their war against Spain. And they take the little seeds of ideas from the German Reformation prints and start to grow their own political print tradition. So the 70s and 80s are the very first true Dutch political prints as they argue for a war against Spain. Yeah, I think people forget how awful <laughs> that period is. Like the Spaniard, I mean, no, you know, shade to the Spaniards, but good Lord. What's your favorite thing in the show? My favorite thing in the show is this little print that the publisher already had a plate for a design after Peter Bruegel, Big Fish Eat Little Fish. So you've got this gargantuan fish that's getting gutted on the shore and out of its mouth spew medium fish and out of their mouth spew little fish. And that was a already very popular parable. I think everybody can relate to the idea that powerful people will exploit not so powerful people to get ahead. It's kind of a sadly timeless message. So he already had this plate. And then when the politician that I study is beheaded, he just adds captions to the fish. So the big fish becomes the Barnevelsche monster. So his name was Johann von Olden Barnevelt. And one of his colleagues who dies in prison is shown with a knife to his throat, like he just adds all this and basically makes a 17th century meme with a Bruegel print. And I just love it because it's so effective and punchy and just like nothing like what Bruegel had in mind, but such a good reuse of that plate. <laughs> That's the thing, you know, we've been doing a history of prints on plate mark with my friend, True Ludwig, and this the whole idea of prints as, as how information got out and politics and news and, and this idea of um, visualizing it for the audience about what, you know, what's really going on and hiding messages and all that stuff. I mean, it's so powerful and it, and you're absolutely right. I love your talking about contemporary, you know, America, cause it's, it just doesn't stop <laughs> and it goes all the way back there. Yeah, it, it really doesn't. There's another very striking example of it. So there were these two brothers, the DeWitt brothers that are, lynched by a political mob in 1672 and i've got two broadsides hanging side by side in the exhibit and one of them says this is citizens justice the government was failing us we had to take matters into our own hands this is actually justice at work and the other one says oh what a terrible crime you know what an atrocity this is, you know, a horrible threat to our government. And you can see the same thing happening in the aftermath of January 6th with the argument for whether or not it's justified or a crime. This is happening on the streets of Amsterdam in 1672 as people are trying to control the narrative about major traumatic political events. 
Sometimes it really makes me wonder about, you know, whoever the designer of human beings and their brains are, like, why, why would you add that bit of other, you know, othering and you always have to have someone who's, you know, lower than you on the totem pole or ladder or caste system or whatever you want to call it. I guess, just, oh my God, I can't stand it. It's true. It's true. And, you know, it's, it's wild because the two parties in the Netherlands, it's not like one's a good guy politically. Like you have one that's sort of proto-monarchy and the other one that's just regent oligarchy. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's more people, but it's the dozens of incredibly wealthy merchants you know it's like neoliberal capitalism now so yeah it's kind of like two shades of that <laughs> there's no there's no uh you know green party um in the 70s yeah century. right i mean well the green party yeah i guess yeah it's true <laughs> the democrats aren't aren't without fault are they i was looking at the pictures you posted on your instagram feed and there's one print that's a uh, ship on wheels what's that one about so that's really cool. Those land yachts, as they're sometimes called, they were originally invented in China, which the Dutch knew because the first maps of China made by Orteus show these little uh, land yachts on them. But the Dutch court engineer makes them and they spin it as this new fancy Dutch invention. But they really were quite remarkable. They built two, one that could carry about 20 folks and the other one I want to say about half that much, but you can see in the print that there are riders on horses that can't keep up with them. So they really could go quite fast down these very flat, wide Dutch beaches near Scheveningen, which is near The Hague. So yeah, quite remarkable. And that particular print shows the Prince of Orange with diplomats and even a Spanish prisoner of war. So sort of like, aren't we great with our engineering and, you know, the world power with such ingenuity. But it's really a leisure activity in the end. It is for the princes. And the the land yachts survive quite a long time. There's accounts that, oh, they're getting rickety now, but it's been like 60 years, so, something years. So they do keep them around and race them down the coast. They must have been just incredible speeds people were totally unaccustomed to going. It must have been really amazing to experience that. Yeah. I'm, what, weren't the first yacht races out of, oh, did I dream that? I'm going to have to double check that one. That's <laughs> probably right. I mean, even the word yacht is from a Dutch word, yacht, which means there to hunt. Go. See, so. I knew you'd know. <laughs> <laughs> the other one that caught my eye was there's a really large uh, sort of panoramic harbor scene that has text all around it. That is a magnificent print. And we are so lucky to have it in the United States, let alone in central Illinois. That is one of two surviving impressions of the of this harbor scene panorama view of Amsterdam by Klaus Janssen Visser. And it's one of only two that still has the letterpress and the additional scenes of the city. The other one is at the Rijksmuseum. They're not keen to lend it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just stunning. So you've got the view of the Amsterdam is the eye, the body of water that you see if you come in today on the train and you disembark to walk into the city, you're right on that body of water. But it's the vantage point of ships carrying cargo into the city. And so you see the maid of Amsterdam, this lovely young woman seated there with the three crosses that visitors to Amsterdam now think are three X's for the red light district, but they're not. Um, <laughs> it's a very long-term coat of arms. And so you see her in the middle and she's receiving tribute from people all over the world. So it's showing these trade relationships as gifts being offered. And what's terrific is if you look at the letterpress, it says like, number one, a Frenchman bringing wine and olives and salt. Number two, you know, a Pole, a Dane, a person from Moscow, a High German, a Low German, an East Indian, a West Indian. It just goes on and on specifying these parts of the world and the goods that are coming in. And this is roughly the same time that Rene Descartes calls Amsterdam the warehouse of the world. And it really is where all of these global commodities are coming in before being dispersed. The harbor was real. Somebody, I feel like some must have been true because I don't know who else would have said it to me. But the that the harbor at some point had five hundred ships coming in and out per day. How 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 is that possible? I don't understand. 
It's just remarkable with the, the war against the Spanish, Antwerp gets blockaded. And so Antwerp is kind of the global entrepot that status declines and Amsterdam really rises. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that prior to the you know, 17th century, Amsterdam is not a great global metropolis. Amsterdam is not a big city, not an important city. It's only with Antwerp's fall in importance, which is why we see printmaking, you know, folks like Hieronymus Koch and the plantain folks down in Antwerp, you know, really dominating 16th century and then the Dutch rise with capital moving more to the north. But yeah, it is just remarkable the ships that were coming in and out. They had a safe harbor to sort of stop and then they would unload um, with little boats. Oh, the warehouses right on the, right on the water. All right, so why don't you tell us about you? Let's move away from the museum and the exhibition for a sec. Let's, I, I like, I mean, my whole idea is to help people understand that we're all people who have really cool jobs. And uh, I just want to, you know, kind of dispel this idea of the scary scholar in the tower kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you seem like my kind of people, Maureen. <laughs> uh, yeah, good, good. Yeah, um, you know, I actually started as an art major. I was making paintings and prints as an undergrad at the University of Kansas. I just loved it, you know, working with Roger Shimomura and, you know, Michael Krieger and um, Judith McRae, all these fabulous art folks. And they said, oh, you, you fine arts people, you have to take art history. And, you know, at first I sort of grumbled, but then I took print connoisseurship with Steve Goddard and it just was like, a little key was turned, you know? He was such a great teacher. He would do things like, um, I mean, the Spencer Art Museum has a fabulous print collection, but he would ask dealers to set aside fake Rembrandt prints, right? So he had this whole manila envelope full of fake Rembrandts. And we would just have a day that he would spread them out on the table. And he would say, tell me, tell me why these aren't real. And, you know, it was just a chance to look really close and talk and, touch actual prints you know, you know it's just like a fun investigation and he just did things like that that made the whole um medium come alive so yeah switch majors yeah <laughs> all it takes is one teacher right yeah. <laughs> the thing though that i have found remarkable is there are so few schools at which one can study print history because it just isn't a I mean, it wasn't in my school, you know, it's been really remarkable when you can find it and find somebody like Steve, who's amazing at it and so knowledgeable. It's true. It's true. The, the universities that can really offer it and have the proper print room space to really enable that kind of looking and viewing and conversations is, is fewer than one would hope. Um, <laughs> yeah. A lot of them have the works on paper collections because they're not as expensive and don't require the same amount of space. You know, painting racks are huge and sculpture, oh man. But, um, you know, Zolander boxes, they're, they're fairly small. But yeah, to have somebody that can talk you through it and help you to really understand, that's, that's unusual and the space and time to dig into it. So yeah, yeah, it is a real rarity. Yeah, and then you went on to Northwestern for your PFUD? Uh, yes, for the food. yes. Um, I got a master's in art history at KU first because uh, I met my wife there and she was doing her master's there. Also um, in art history? No, she has a, a real job, as I joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's a social worker. Okay. Um, so she was getting her master's in social work. And then, yeah, I, I went to Northwestern. I wanted to work with somebody who does Dutch art, but prints, like a, a real, not paintings and prints, but, you know, with prints as a side dish to the main, like I wanted a real prints person. So I looked at a lot of different schools and yeah, I went to Northwestern. Who's at Northwestern um, or was? Wadi S1. Oh, okay. So she had written a book on Jacques de Chaine and um, his images of that are sort of about art and science and witchcraft. Dutch art history is kind of conservative in its methodology. I don't know if all old master subjects are like this, but there's still a lot of being a connoisseur of a single blue chip artist and kind of, which has its place. And I'm very happy that some people do that, but I'm very much a subject scholar, not a, not a specific artist scholar. 
I think people, listeners, unless they're in the biz, as we like to say, <laughs> they probably have no idea that there are uh, varying methods of how one might attack the subject matter. Yeah, it's really, it's not there for folks that study contemporary art. It's very rapidly accepted, like what seem, some people call, you know, visual visual studies or, um, you know, material, mater, visual material studies, like uh, that we're not just going to look at the quote unquote most beautiful art or most expensive or art for the most elite classes. But yeah, it's just more resistant in older forms of art that we can be a little more expansive in our definition of art. And that really fits quite well with, I mean, my exhibition is a totally spot on example of this. Like there's stuff in there that you find in, in libraries many places, but not art museums. So this kind of what is art, you know, for contemporary art, it's a banana on a wall, but <laughs> <it's art. laughs> has to be by a named master. You know. Right. Yeah, we. I was talking with um, Elizabeth Wyckoff at the St. Louis Art Museum, and who did her dissertation, <clears throat> excuse me, also in Holland. And she was talking about the, all the various archives that she visited to see X, Y, and Z prints, and and that that the town the town hall had a collection somewhere. I forget where Delft, I think. And I was like, "What do you mean the city <laughs> has a print collection? Like, what the heck? It's so crazy." It's true. It's true. Yeah, you just never know where you'll end up going. I got to go to the so the royal family has a collection in the Netherlands and like one of their homes in The Hague, which is where they stable their horses. So there are all of these gorgeous animals with braids in their hair and me as a little graduate student there to look at some objects that they held. But so, wait, so you just said the royal I mean, I think in my brain, I knew that there was a royal family there. But after this whole fight for the Republican, the Protestant Reformation and all that, like, what, how, how did they survive? I know it's bananas. So um, like so many things, we can blame this on Napoleon. Um, <laughs> he installs a relative as the king of the Netherlands when they take control of the Netherlands. And... The relative actually does a pretty decent job. He doesn't want to send the Dutch to war to support Napoleon, um, which causes problems. But when he's ousted, they're like, oh, we do like the kind of 19th century glam of monarchy. So they keep, they reinstall the family that had served as um, stadtholder, which is like an elected position that you lead the military. But it's the closest they have to monarchs. But yeah, and so it's, it's kind of shocking because the Amsterdam Town Hall is a monument to republicanism, to an alternative to monarchy. And now it's called the palace because it's officially a royal palace when all the iconography is about a republic. <laughs> when my kids were little, when we first moved to Baltimore, we went to the Unitarian Church downtown and there's a very Christian Last Supper mural, uh -huh. mosaic mural by Tiffany above the altar. <laughs> It's the same, like, why is that there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same thing. Same yeah, exactly. Thing. <laughs> so, but this whole idea of them, I mean, Queen Elizabeth died yesterday as we're mm -hmm. recording this. So, you know, England itself is a democracy with a monarchy too. Like it's, it is, and I feel like it is this idea of the glam, but, you know, we're all attracted by it, aren't we? Yeah, I think the Dutch have a slightly more cynical view than the English. Um, I mean, I feel like they have that slightly more cynical view on many subjects than the English, but there's a real attitude of like, you better prove your worth to us because at any time we could kick you out. So they do expect their monarchs to work. I mean, of course they have lavish properties and holdings and it's a good paying gig, but Queen Beatrix, who was the queen forever and ever, she spoke 14 languages and could do polite greetings and a bajillion, I don't know, I, this is hyperbole, but she was expected to act as a, a diplomat and help smooth diplomatic relations between governments. The idea of predicating one's worth on blood is, um, of course, problematic, but. Right. Do you, do you speak Dutch? Javel. Yavel. <laughs> I do not. <laughs> I do. Yeah. I don't get so much chance to practice it, um, but I do. Um, 
And that was just in because you were studying that particular subject or was it, was there some family reason no, or no family reason? It's funny when I would go to the Netherlands, people would be like, why do you study Dutch? And I was like, I just, I like it. And they'd say, but, <laughs> so you could pick anything and you picked this, <laughs> you could have gone, you could be in Italy right now on the beach. No, just a lot of summer classes, a lot of summer classes. And then I lived in the Netherlands for two years when I was doing my research. So they all speak English. So I just have to say, you know, I'm, I'm practicing. Can we, can we please speak in Dutch? <laughs> I remember taking a courier trip for, I don't remember what museum, uh, um, and getting to Germany and, and I have, um, German heritage in my family and, and people started asking me for directions. And I just looked around going, these are my people. <laughs> I fit right <laughs> in, you know, did you get that? When, are you part Dutch in any way? Uh, no, I'm not. No. Um, Irish, Swedish, and English. Okay. So, all very, my people don't, don't tan as I say. <laughs> People don't expect non-Dutch or folks who have immigrated to the Netherlands to be trying to learn Dutch. So people would think that I was, you know, a, a person who had, had relocated there to live permanently. Oh, okay. There, there wasn't an expectation that a student would be learning. Because you can study at the University of Amsterdam and take classes in English. Oh, okay. I've never been to Amsterdam. It's, it's high up on my Northern Europe list, I have to say once we start traveling again. <laughs> Go in the fall when the leaves are off the trees, the canal houses look the best. Oh, okay. The, they're so narrow, the streets, that like the trees really block the view. So it's quite pretty in the fall and a lot oh. fewer people. Right, right, of course. Yeah, so you as a Dutch um, scholar, I have, I'm, I have wanted to have somebody like you at my beck and call for so long because I look at those names when I'm cataloging or whatever in the collections. And I think I, I'm pretty sure I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. <laughs> so I, I'm not even going to try. This was the first one that popped up for me recently. Ooh, crash. Is that reading right? Jakob von Rousdale. It's yeah. not Royce Dial. Rousdale. Rousdale. Oh, yes. I knew I should ask you because I was like, I, I'm sure I'm wrong. Okay. What about this one? I think you've already said for us. Uh, Jakob de Chaim. Chaim. So the G-H is a G? Yeah, the G is a G. So like it's Van Gogh. Van Houda. Okay. But what about our friend Goltzius? Goltzius. Yeah, Goltzius. Goltzius, Hendrik Goltzius. That's it? Yeah. It's just G? G? Yeah. yeah it's not Hendrik Goltzius or anything? Uh, no. Hendrik what? <laughs> See, I told you I was wrong. <laughs> A good tip is that the Y and the IJ are um, interchangeable in 17th century Dutch and they sound the same. So like the I, the water body behind Amsterdam, that's the harbor, they, it all sounds like your I. So a Y and an IJ are I. Okay. So uh, that's a good okay. tip. That's all right. Yeah, that is a good tip. Thank like you. Like the Hein. Right. Exactly. Jan Virix. Vir so the W's or V's? Yeah, a good tip to remember that is my Dutch tutor. I was like learning seasonal vocabulary and I was like, what is watermelon? And she was like, watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this one's probably is more straightforward than I think it is. Hans Kollart. Kollart. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, this one has always tripped me up. Okay. Kork, Jorg, and then what's the last? I got PE. Tank. Tank to some people. Pence? Pence. Pence. It is Pence. I've always George gotten Pence. tripped up I by that one. George. Let's see. I don't know why. Let's see. Oh, um, and then this one. Oh, yes. Romain de Hoja. Hoja? Hoja. All right. So you, I read somewhere that you think he's um, underrated and the most important artist in, in your sort of sphere. Yeah. Go. I think he is, hot take, <clears throat> he is as important a printmaker as Rembrandt. Oh. oh. Yeah. Boom, there it is. Okay, yeah. go. So, here are the reasons why. He completely revolutionizes political artwork. No one before him makes political satire. We would not have William Hogarth the way we do. We would not have James Gilray the way we do without Romain de Hoja. He is 
the one to in, to invent modern political satire. And we are living with the treasure trove of images as a result. Political cartoons we see in the newspaper all the time are indebted to strategies he introduced. So for that alone, he should be a household name, at least among print nerds. And was he prolific? Was he making things that would be broadside slash newspaper illustration versus I'm going to collect Rembrandt? He was insanely prolific. Um, thousands, thousands and thousands of images, high thousands. It's hard to say because he had, he started a school that we don't know very much about, an art academy. And then he had a huge workshop that he trained to work in his style. So it's very hard to kind of parse what's his workshop and what's him. I want to say the Rijksmuseum has something like seven to 9,000 prints. Like it's just like an insane amount. So under his name, but possibly by workshop of, yeah, it's super okay. hard to tell, but he did right. a lot of book illustrations and things. So high volume. He's really, really prolific. He does everything from newsprints. So very straightforward, seemingly neutral depictions of contemporary events. He does allegories, he does historical scenes, but the thing that really launches him into being so important is he ties himself to William III. So William III is one of these Dutch stat holders, military commanders, and he marries the daughter of the English king. And the English king is Catholic at that time, and he sees the chance to become king of England. He sees the chance that if he can get the Dutch to pay for the invasion, he can become king of England. And he does. It, William and Mary, you know, this is oh, right. Dutch William. So in order to do this, though, they have to convince the people that hold the purse strings that this is in the Netherlands' best interest, because it's incredibly expensive to invade England. And to do that, they need Romain de Hoja. And he invents this brand new style of printmaking. So earlier prints, Gombrich calls them emblematic, but they're kind of like decoding a picture. Like you have the all seeing eye of God or, you know, um, a church in the sky. You have all of these elements that you decode and then maybe there's an inscription. So it's, it's very sort of like Photoshop paste kind of a lot of the time. But he introduces these serial characters that are like the kind of characters we'll see in A Rake's Progress with Hogarth. So funny characters, but they are ridiculing people like Louis XIV of France. So these very funny stories that have a narrative that really, in a very biting wit kind of way, attack royal monarchs and make the case successfully that the Dutch should intervene and that William should be their man. No biggie. I mean, <laughs> I think it's, I should be king of that place over there. Yeah. Like it's, I've, I've always found that insane, like this idea that you can just, you know, conquer. Ugh. Yeah. I'll like, what's wrong with what you've got? <laughs> <laughs> You're Catholic. Right. So. But so, so he marries the, does he wait for the king to die or he actually wages war and, and beheads the man or like what happens? Yeah. So James II is king and James flees. He hears that William is coming over with all of these ships and troops. And he's so afraid he flees and hangs out in France. He just gets out of town. And is, so his daughter, the queen consort or something is, is so, like, let's do it. So it's Mary Stuart. They're already married and she's, um, yeah, she's then the queen of England. And, they're heartily welcomed. I mean, England had been Protestant for so long, so far before, and while there had been Catholics, they hadn't had a Catholic reigning monarch for a really long time. So James II was not terribly popular as a Catholic king. The idea that this very well moneyed Dutchman who was Protestant was going to come over and, you know, at least half the match is English, people were okay with it. Also, William was not dumb, and so one of the first things they did was set up printing presses and just saturate with print media saying how great this was and all the reasons everybody should feel good. So it was like a mass press to get the word out. Like They used the, the printed word and printed image to great effect to, to launch this campaign. That's amazing. The power of the print. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it's specifically mentioned the advisors are like, make sure you have at least one press with like the cannons and horses and so like bring the press over. Oh my God. It's incredible, really. The I, I, That's the other thing I think people forget is, you know, it, it's our shared visual culture, but it's been used for many years, long his, Western history as, as a propaganda tool to change the course of history. It's insane. Yeah, it really has. I mean, dramatic fates of tons of people, millions of people change with, with these yeah. movies. Yeah. How do, how do you know the truth? You know, how do you know the truth in the... Well, I think it's like not how do you know the truth. It's it's which competing truths are out there, and which right. one. Everybody's putting spin. You know, everybody's eliminating the. Everybody's quiet on their missteps and really amplifying their victories. So even those that are more honest are not totally honest. Right. Are you? Were you always interested in? Pol I mean, I know you got into this through art, but. Like, you clearly have a, a brain for the political stuff. <laughs> I have always been a politics junkie. Like, I love reading and hearing about politics. I love it. I think when I was much younger, I used to think that if you knew enough about it, you could change people's minds. You could have discussions and reason stuff out. And as I've gotten older and the country's gotten more partisan, now I see that so much political media is not aimed at changing anybody's opinion it's aimed at entrenching people in beliefs they already have you know kind of like rah rah rally your troops kind of thing but i just find it so fascinating the mechanics of of persuasion even if you're just convincing somebody they're already right about something yeah i just want to peek behind the curtain also see what's what's happening like how the show is being run so yeah i really like it i've always really found it interesting I'm I'm always curious to know, is there some sort of overarching plan or do people just sort of fall in line as they find other people are f thinking in a particular way? Do you know what I mean? You mean with like political groups and ideologies? Yeah, like, you know, in the American uh, post-Civil War South, where when the federal troops are sent back to Washington and there's, you know, the, the white supremacists are all of a sudden able to do what they did for mm -hmm. however many years. Like, was there some sort of council of people saying in all of these states, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, or does it just happen more organically? That's a great question. I'm less familiar with the American context, but at least for the Dutch, there do seem to be a group of people in the know that the best way I've been able to describe it is they, they get what I would call talking points now. They get a kind of essentialized message or plan and disseminate that and then let the various groups elaborate on the details. But if okay. you can get a central concept or plan, it's extremely effective to let everyone sort of spin out their own version. Yeah, like, like you know, the, the Republicans going back to Nixon or whenever they decided to make abortion the, you know, the linchpin debate or whatever, like, did they foresee where we are now and say, this is exactly where we want to get? Or, like, you know, like, it feels maniacal to me. <laughs> I mean, there's all those think tanks and strategists. That's their exact right. goal. I was just listening to NPR and they were saying that the one that we can expect to see from the Democrats in the coming election is calling out Republicans as extremists. So that phrase, this is an extremist point of view, this is extremism, will be the strategy. And so you'll see it peppered through speeches and ads. So like there are people crafting a strategy that looks organic when it's used. The Republicans have been calling the left wing crazy witch hunt whatever's for however yeah. many years. Like it's, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the Democrats always seem to be one step behind somehow. Yeah. yeah. So this is, yeah, the opposite version of wokeism will be like using the term extremism the way woke has been manipulated to mean different things. Right. That's so, insane. yeah, it's wild because this guy that was discussing it said that your goal as, you know, someone crafting political strategy is to make your opponent be on the defensive so they spend all them their time defending themselves from claims of negativity and they can't get their message out and they can't attack you. 
So you have to be like, I'm not an extremist or, you know, I'm not woke in the way you mean woke. Um, and it's like, wow, this is why we don't have substantive debate on issues because the winning strategy is get your opponent on the defensive. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be any, the discourse idea seems to be, have died. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do that. We, can, no. we can't bring two solutions to the table and debate which is better. No, There's and it, there doesn't seem to be a particularly positive end in sight. Like there, there's no good that's going to come out of this. It's not new though. Like these images that are 400 years old that I study, they're the same. The Jesuits are the devil. The Spanish are the devil. They're all heretics who sleep with everyone. I mean, it's the same. It's the same. Right. Ad hominem attacks. You attack the person, not their ideas. Right. Right. It's the same. But this. But the Spanish English, I mean, let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sometimes there is a, a reason. <laughs> it was a bit extreme, wasn't it? You Pushing. die if you don't believe what I believe? Like, come on, really? Pushing you too far. <laughs> right, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, and the other thing that True pointed out to me in, in a, one of our episodes about the, I think, I can't remember which one, but it was, he just slid right in there. Why do you think all of those Spanish museums have such wonderful Netherlandish works of art I'm like oh for sake yeah. <laughs> like yeah, oh, really damn overlord. it <laughs> speaking of acquisitions maureen it looked to me like you somehow managed to buy a bunch of really wonderful things towards this exhibition i did i did i got so so lucky in being able to build the collection this way the main reason for that is this kind of print is super cheap super cheap the larger the ratio of text, even when it's by a known, really excellent artist, the value just like tanks. Isn't that weird? It is weird. So like a, a broadside by a really exceptional Dutch printmaker, like famous for his time, known is a three digit purchase, but a drawing by that same guy is high six digits. So it's just really crazy. It's just not a type of printmaking that has much um, commercial value right now. Then after your show, Maureen. It will change. <laughs> <laughs> not that curators have effect on the market or anything. Right, right, <laughs> right. Which is never the intention, of course. You just want to help share and, and help people understand the story you're telling. But I think most people have no idea and are, in fact, some of them rightly offended how expensive it is to borrow artwork. People just don't realize that it is a very big deal to borrow, you know, three sheets of paper from another museum. It's a very big sticker price. So cheaper to buy the works yourself. Yeah. It's way like we could buy 50 for what it would cost to borrow a few from overseas. From the Rikes Museum. Yeah. Right. Of course. So where, like, where do you source this kind of stuff? Like, I don't feel like I'm coming across it and well, I'm not traveling through old master print land too much these days, but very few, very few of these types of works you would find in, in regular print dealers. I, I go to a lot of book dealers. So antiquarians who sell both prints and books. And there's this great site called Catawiki, which is Dutch eBay, C-A-T-A-W-I-K-I. -I, great for all kinds of things because it's quote unquote curated. So there's a person that really knows prints, like a real print expert or several of them. The guy that does old master prints, he's vetted and he'll say what watermark it is. So it'll be multiple sellers. A lot of times other antiquarians or print sellers, and then there'll be in auctions. Huh. So... Wow. Yeah. There's some really great stuff in there. I gotta stay on it. I also collect um, Dutch tiles and it's a great place to buy Dutch tiles. Oh, right. Ceramics. <laughs> Let's talk about that. My God. What a, um, what a well-rounded scholar. Because <laughs> 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 you cover painting and sculpture too at the Cran Art, right? I do. I do. I cover everything. Yeah. I'm Europe and North America before 1850. So I, I reinstalled our ancient Greek and Roman gallery. I mean, and America. Oh, I go all back. Yeah. Oh my America. God. They did no, some stuff. No biggie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's worse that, you know, we always talk about print people being generalists because you have to talk about dirt to, tomorrow, right? Right, right. But you, you add on all everything else. No, wor no worries. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Yeah. And we don't have a curator of Asian art and I did my minor in 
Qing Dynasty Chinese. So I also cover Asia, East Asia for us. Okay, hold on now. Yeah. Qing Dynasty, how would you ever narrow in on something? I mean, how do you, uh, oh my God. Uh, I picked it because Northwestern has this rule that if you study something pre, pre 19th century, you have to either study post 19th century or non-Western as one of your minors. And the Chinese and Dutch were trading for so long. So porcelain is incredibly important for the Dutch. So I was like, I really like 17th and 18th century Chinese art. I'll just focus on that dynasty and learn more about what they were doing in China. Huh. So that's where the ceramics part comes in? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it started with porcelain and then it grew wildly out of control. Um, <laughs> I just really, really like ceramics. One of my teachers at KU, I remember saying, ceramics are great. They're so easy to break, but so hard to destroy. And it's like, this is true. You always oh, have shards. Interesting. Yeah. So you can look way, way back. Yeah. I love it all. I love tomb ceramics, ancient tomb ceramics. I love early trade ceramics. I love blue and white. I did a blue and white show. I could do another blue and white show. I could do them every other year and be happy. <laughs> I like contemporary ceramics. Yeah, I just really enjoy it. It's a, a, a medium that is getting its moment, isn't it? It is. And it's a medium that has always been a lot more inclusive. Like always. Even medieval Europe, you have like early tarot cards showing women at the wheel, throwing pots. The craft world is has always been much more full of women makers and makers of color. So it's a, it's a cool place to be. Well, right. It's another, yet another false hierarchy, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, but I mean, the utilitarian piece of it, 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 I mean, that's always the sort of moment when I'm like, well, you're here. you know, it's beautiful and utilitarian versus, yeah. <clears throat> and with, and with pottery or ceramics, sorry, is pottery a bad word? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Okay. It's not my world, so I don't know. It has a foot in both camps, right? It does. It does. And um, I mean, sometimes you get things like such incredible works that they're never meant to be, you know, really truly used because they're so precious. I think in both ceramics and printmaking, one of the things I like is that people that get really into both become very well versed in technique. And one of the first things they're interested in is how is this made? And the kind of technological advancements and experimentation is so important for both fields. And I think that that's a real close area of overlap. Also because of, as you mentioned, like the hierarchy, they're both fields whose practitioners or those that love them are kind of used to not being taken quite as seriously. So you get kind of like a more goofy, fun loving type of crowd, not, right. not more, more relaxed. <laughs> goofy, fun loving type of crowd. <laughs> Hey, listeners, you hear that? <laughs> right. Do you want to be with the uptight people or the fun? No. <laughs> That's why the print people are the best people. And apparently right. the ceramics people, too. Also. We are the nicest people in the art world. That's right. <laughs> so you mentioned that the that the show was 10 years in the making, based, I assume, off of your dissertation. Yeah, I've been researching the subject matter for 10 years and actively working on the show for five it was one of the first shows I pitched when I was hired here as a curator, but I knew we would have to grow a base collection to support it. And we're really lucky to have several donors that support print purchases. And um, we're excited to see the research potential of the show. But then the thing that really solidified it and gave it legs was the, I received one of those Getty Paper Project grants, which are these awards to early career curators to kick off a project that not just a project that they think is interesting, but really kind of push one curator forward with a chance early on to do something big and substantive to learn a lot about the profession because the, the Getty felt that the print curatorship was kind of falling behind as some lines and museums weren't being renewed and there just weren't opportunities anymore where you'd have a senior and a junior curator side by side and you'd have someone to mentor you and train you. So they were trying to capture and um, push forward some of that expertise. 
Yeah, the that's it's a great program, truthfully, because not I mean not only is are there fewer and fewer museums keeping the print curators, you know, in the print department, but <laughs> there's nobody's letting go of their jobs because there's nowhere to go, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. And you know, I've seen major museums say, well, our curator of European or whatever, or like our curator of something else can just do prints also. So yeah, they just get folded in and disappear. Yeah, sure. The general history can overflow between one and the other, but the, the minutia of print, like you have to be mm -hmm. a real detail lover and <laughs> Yeah. To be a print and or ceramics person, apparently. <laughs> I mean, it yeah. just doesn't make any sense to throw it into a panning department in, in no way. No, it, and it's immediately going to fall back into a kind of not even secondary, like really sort of relegated medium. I mean, that was the whole point of forming print councils, so far as I know, to combat this idea that this was just not that important, not that interesting medium. It's like, that's the default which I think is entirely bound up in commercial value, but we could, we could talk yes. about that. Otherwise, this very important kind of fundamental mode of communication for both aesthetic ideas and knowledge gets sort of pushed down to the bottom again. Yeah, it's a mistake, honestly. Of course we think that, but yeah. And <laughs> I, I mean, I've known many painting curators who are like, well, I've got a gap in my wall. What do you got <laughs> to yeah. the print department? And they don't, they don't like paper and they think it's stupid because you can't have it on the wall for more than six months or whatever the, you know, determined time is. It's a wall fill. It's a gap filler. And I think, you know, the addition of the technical understanding that is required, you know, that part is like, Ugh, I don't want to learn that. Why can't it just be a brush on a canvas? Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the moments that, that print collections really shine really are in print study rooms. And when you can get folks down and have that more intimate conversational mode of viewing, where you're looking at things longer, closer, not under glass, in a discussion setting, it's like, oh yeah, I get it. We wouldn't be doing this with a room of paintings in quite the same way. This does facilitate a kind of special looking and gathering that's more communal and more of a, a co-production of, I mean, I'm at a university, so co-production of knowledge or, you know, viewing pleasure. Right. Yeah. I always thought of the print room as the, as the, you know, secondary front door of the museum. Like lots of people came through the print room with their first visit, which was obviously our job to make it a positive one. So they'd come back. Do you, I assume you guys have an active, cause you're a university museum, an active study room and classes are frequently there. We do, we do, although it's been disrupted. We have a 1960s main building with a 1980s addition, and it feels like between the roof and the HVAC of each building and transitions to LED, there have been just building projects on and off that seem to disrupt it um, lately. So I'm, I'm looking forward to construction to stop and we can actually be back in there. And hopefully you have some help because if you're the only person running a print department, it, boy, that can eat your time like nobody's business. Our registrar and collections manager are awesome and pulls stuff all the time, but we have four curators and the other curator, our modern and contemporary curator is in there a lot for photography. We have a curator who basically does mid-century American because that's what this collection is strongest in. Huge percentage of works on paper. She's in there all the time. At least you have curators who are excited yeah. about paper. <laughs> yeah. How, she is. how big is the collection? 11,000 objects. Okay. And yeah. predominantly mid century American. Predominantly, yeah. We had a cash prize for contemporary art until um, I think from 1948 to 1967. And it was one of two cash prizes in the US. So they bought Rothko, all of these people for nothing, because it was one of the only ways they can not just be acquired as first prize, but actually make some money. Right. Oh, that's great. So Does that then, mean you have a, a substantial collection of Atelier 17 thing? Oh right? yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we do. And we, we were subscribers to Tamarin for a very long time. And then oh, okay. we stopped. Um, right. Oh, well, that makes sense. I often ask people, guests, if they, if particularly curator types, if they have a retirement gift from the collection in their brain, like fictitious, obviously. 
Huh. Like a, the, your favorite thing that you would love to, you know, have for your own self, which you can't, of course. You know, my favorite printmaker is Hendrik Holtzius. Mm. And I just love those um, swelling and tapering lines. Me too. I'm a total fan. Love mannerism. Love mannerism. But let's see. Let's see. If I could have any, you know what? A print that I love, would love to have because it's so weird and so interesting. I'm normally not super into religious imagery, but Jacques Bellange, the French mannerist printmaker, has a pieta that is so strange. It's like beautiful, but weird. It's strangely erotic. It's just, it's just bizarro. That's the best word for it. And okay. <laughs> there's just something about it that I find, I mean, it's mannerism. It's mannerism. It's like beautiful, strange distortion. It just feels like nothing I've ever seen when I've seen so many Pieta images. Every time I'm sort of astounded. And it's got this gorgeous stippling on the body of Christ. It's just like the most stunning technique. And he was just a strange guy that we don't know that much about and not that many impressions survive and he didn't make that many prints and so but the french yeah. don't enter the picture till way late in the history of western prints like is Belange one of the early ones he's early and he's in nancy and Isn't like that where Kello is yeah the records yeah. that describe him though are like um he's a set painter and he's a painter like he's not Printmaking is not his number one thing, but the prints that he makes are great and weird. Hmm. They're so weird. He has this thing where he likes to show the belly button through the fabric, like you sometimes see with Pontormo. <laughs> it's like, for no reason, we'll just show the belly button. I love it. <laughs> that is weird. Yeah, That's they're weird. kind of surreal. <laughs> I'm have to start paying attention to belly buttons. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, how what fabric dips that way? Okay. Right, right. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to what, tell us about the Craner and how, why people should come see you? Well, we are free. That's a good place to start. And, um, it, you know, the University of Illinois has a lot of draws and most of people associate us with STEM things, you know, a great engineering program, all those other things, the north end of campus. But there's a lot of awesome art stuff, whether it's the Cranert Center for Performing Arts or the Cranert Art Museum. And if you find yourself in Chicago in need of a day trip or Indianapolis or St. Louis, we're, you know, an easy jaunt. How far, how many hours drive are you from those places? We are about an hour and a half from Indy or St. Louis, Chicago, depending on where in Chicago. So I was in Evanston, it's really more like three hours from Evanston. Okay. The first hour is just Chicago. Right. <laughs> um, we are on the Amtrak line between Chicago and New Orleans. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, so it just kind of depends on what part of Chicago land. I'll take day trips to Chicago. You can take the Amtrak down in the morning from Chicago, spend the day, and then take the afternoon train back. Right. That's a great idea. It's like me going to New York for the day. Yeah. Nice it little trip. <laughs> If people want to follow you and your work, the best place to do that is on Instagram, probably. Instagram, yeah, probably. Um, yeah, I have a Twitter account, but I don't use it so much. Yeah, I don't use mine either. Uh, we're visual people. That's right. I need sake. a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. You are Maureen underscore E underscore Warren. That's on right. Insta. I have you pulled up right now. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was a good time. It's been great talking to you. And the book is available Amazon anywhere or? Yeah. Yeah. You can order it directly from the distributor if you don't like supporting Amazon. And it's um, art. You search paper knives and art book. The distributor is all one word, art book. Okay. Great. It was great talking to you and I appreciate you doing it. And we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get people to your show because it sounds awesome. so cool. All right. Well, thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode with Maureen Warren. I love hearing curators talk about their projects, even those ones that take 10 years to come to fruition, because gosh knows there. Certainly many of those. I worked on Hater for 10 years and then nothing ever happened. So <laughs> stay tuned, hopefully something will happen someday. 
I want to thank Michael Diamond for the use of his original music. And a last reminder that any images we talk about are over on the show notes at platemarkpodcast.com. And also a, another plea for support. Go to the support and donate button on the platemarkpodcast.com page. It gives you two options, one for a monthly support and one for a one-time donation. Next time, we're checking in with artist Tom Huck, who was the subject of an earlier episode in Series 3 of Plate Mark. Tom has a special a special project that's being introduced and published right around Thanksgiving. And so this is a check-in with him about his work and that project so that everyone knows it's coming and will keep their eyes peeled for it. All right, we'll see you next time. <laughs>